think I wanted to be a writer ever since I was a little child. The first thing I wrote was a poem called I Wish I Had a Pony. <laughs> Small or tall, big or little, red or blue. You know, I kind of wasn't a great poem, but I used to write terrible poetry as a teenager, angst ridden like lots of people do. And I used to think someday I'm going to be a writer. And then one of my friends said to me, Oh, no, you can't be a writer. I must have been about 18, just at that point when we were applying to university. She said, writers are really poor. I'm going to be a lawyer, be one of those. So I went, oh, okay, I'll do that too. So I, I applied to go to university and to study law, and stupidly someone accepted me. And I spent the entire first year hiding from my law professor. I also had specialised in going to the law library, putting all my belongings down, my pen and my little book and my notepad, and then drinking coffee all day, and then going back to the law library and picking all my stuff up and going to the bar. <laughs> I failed. <laughs> it wasn't. <laughs> it wasn't what I was going to do. Um, so then I decided that I will become a journalist, because being a journalist is a lot like being a writer in a lot of ways, except you're telling real stories instead of imaginary ones. And um, even that didn't go that well. I went along to um, the place where they did the journalism course and it was the 1980s and I was wearing a floor length electric blue coat, a yellow leather belt and dangly yellow earrings. I looked pretty good actually. <laughs> and the three gentlemen in suits, old gentlemen in suits, said to me, what is it you want to do in journalism? And I went, I want to go to London and work in magazines. And they went, Yes, well, we recommend our journalists stay in the provinces and work on local newspapers. I didn't get accepted to journalism school. So I went to London anyway, and I managed to um, lie and cheat my way into jobs on magazines and did all sorts of things. But in the back of my head, I always thought I'm going to write a novel someday. I never actually started writing, and I've since discovered this is the reason lots of people don't write novels, because the hardest thing in the world is to just get your bottom down on the seat and start writing. Then, when I was in my late 20s, do you guys know the writer Sarah Kate Lynch? Yes. Well, she and I met in London on one of the magazines I worked on, and she invited me to her wedding in the Wire Rapper. And she knew that I couldn't find a boyfriend in Europe. Because <laughs> essentially I was too tall. They just wouldn't have a bar of me. So she said, look, it's fine, it's fine, we're going to get your boyfriend. You should come to my wedding in New Zealand. Meet my friend Han, he's from one of New Zealand's richest families. Which wasn't completely a lie, but what she failed to tell me was, his father had spent all the money that he got. So, anyway, by the time I discovered this, it was too late. I went to Sarah Kate's wedding in the Wire Apple, which was beautiful. It was the first time I'd been to New Zealand, and I thought New Zealand was fantastic. And there was this allegedly rich guy, and um, he was... He was actually wearing a suit that was about three sizes too small for him and a hideous shade of brown, but I saw beyond that yeah. to the money. And I bounced up to him and said, Hi, my name is Nikki and I'm going to marry you. Yeah. Yes, I had been drinking. <coughs> and he said, Oh yeah, if you like. <laughs> Which, sort of almost 20 years on, I've discovered he pretty much says to everything. Just for anything for a quiet life. But I was hugely encouraged, and we ended up having a long-distance romance. We um, met up in San Francisco, and we drove down the Pacific Coast Highway to Los Angeles together in a convertible. It was the single, only romantic thing we've ever done together. He doesn't actually have a romantic bone in his body, but I found that out that, that too late by the time I moved here. So I moved here when I was 30, maybe 1, 30. And I came and worked on the New Zealand Women's Weekly because Sarah Kate Lynch, having found me a boyfriend, also gave me a job <laughs> and a company car. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't say no, really. But again, I was busy. Weekly magazines are re People often say to me, tell us some stories about your time at the Women's Weekly. And I was like, it's just all blur. I just remember Princess Diana and then the Queen and, oh, Princess Diana and Rachel Hunter. And it's a big blur in my head. I can't really remember. All I remember is that I didn't write a novel. And then one day I was at work and I got an email from a friend that said, oh, we just had the news that Angela Dordney has got a brain tumour and it's really serious and, um, you know, it's, it's not, she's not expected to live. And I didn't know, we weren't, Angela and I weren't friends, but I had interviewed her a few times. She had poodles and I had poodles, so we had a little poodle bond. Mm -hmm. And we'd always got on quite well. 
And that email was just the moment when I thought, oh, she's only 56. And yesterday she was fine, and today she's been diagnosed with this terrible condition. And, you know, we can't put things off in life. I guess it was my seize the day moment. It was the day I realized that you can say someday, someday, and then someday might just not come. So I went home that night and I had this ancient, you remember those tiny little Mac computers? They were about this big, like a little box with a screen about this big in it. I fired it up and I, I wrote the first few pages of my first novel, Delicious, which is down over there. And then I realized two things. One was that my computer had been invented before email and the little disks that went into it had been discontinued. So in fact, my book was going to be trapped on it and I would never be able to get it on. And the other was that you probably weren't just supposed to sit down and write a novel. You were meant to have a plan. And my plan, I did have one. My plan had been to go to Italy where my father comes from. He comes from Naples in the south. To spend six months there with my aunties, who were all amazing cooks, and to get them to teach me their food, and then to weave a story around their recipes. And that was why it was never happening, because who can just take off for six months to Italy when they've got bills and mortgages and poodles? Um, <laughs> so that was why I put it off. So I, I sort of needed to write the book, but without the fabulous trip. And so I sat down and thought a little bit harder about the plot and the characters and actually came up with a bit of a plan for Delicious. But as I'd only written about 10,000 words of it, and then Angela Dordney, um, rang me up and said that Penguin Publishers had asked her to do a, her autobiography. And she's a person that was very capable of writing her own book, but she knew she was sick and she didn't want to waste time writing. Basically, she wanted to get on with living. So she said, will you write it for me? So of course I said yes. Yeah. And that was a fantastic gift she did to me, partly because I didn't really know if I could write a whole book. Um, but with her, I knew we had to write it pretty quickly while she could, we could still get her story from her and I wanted it to be published in time for her to see it. So I didn't have time to sit around going, oh, I don't know, it's too hard, I've got writer's block. I just had to get on with it. Mm -hmm. Plus, I had to do all these other things, like um, when the time for the book came out, came along, she said to me, well, she didn't say, actually, the publisher said to me, Angela can no longer speak properly to talk at her own launch, which, as you can imagine, was terrible for her because she was a broadcaster and she was very proud of her diction. And they said, please, will you speak? And I said, no, I can't. I'm really sure. I can't go and talk to people. And Angela just went like this to me. I went, all right, I'll do it. <laughs> she was quite scary. I liked her, but you didn't argue with her. So all these things, as a result of writing her book, I was kind of forced out of my comfort zone, I guess. And the book did really well. It went to um, number one in the bestseller list. And she was really moved by that. I remember I went to see her. And just to torture her, I read the bestseller list out to her backwards in reverse order. So I was like, number nine, really, really slowly. <laughs> and she was thrilled when I got to number one and, and she was there. Then, so then I went back to Delicious. And honestly, after writing Angela's book, which was so sad because she was sick and I, you know, we knew it wasn't going to end well, to just go back to my own story and my own characters, my own little imaginary world, was actually a real pleasure. I didn't have any pressure on me because I didn't have any publishers and I honestly didn't think the book would ever get published. I thought even if, as long as I reach the end, even if it lives under my bed in a shoebox, I will have written a novel and I can stop saying it's something I'm going to do someday. I don't care if it never gets published. Of course I wanted it to be. I was really, really lucky it was. It was published first in New Zealand and then I thought I'd find an agent. So I just googled agents UK. Yeah sent the first um, few chapters and a cover letter off to a bunch of agents who seemed to publish the kind of books that I write. And um, four of them rejected me, and one of them said, yes, but it will need a lot of rewriting. Man, did I rewrite that book. I got used to writing and crying. It was really hard. It was like, oh, my words, my precious words, and they're all changing. But I realized they were, my, my agent was right, and then when she got me a publishing deal, my editor went, we like your book, but it needs some rewriting. So I've already rewritten it. No, it needs some more. And I do remember I emailed her and said, thank you very much, but I can't do it, goodbye. And she emailed me back and went, yes, you can. And she, I think, taught me to write. Her name is Yvette Golden, and sadly she retired because she was just the best editor in the world. And I think the difference between a good novel and a bad novel is often the person that reads it and sends the 26 pages of helpful suggestions to the author, <laughs> sometimes more. And that book ended up being published around the world, lots of different countries. I have to say, I wrote it so long ago, 
and it was the first book I wrote that I always feel a bit unsure about it, but people still come to me and say, oh, it's my favourite, which is slightly depressing when you've written five more. To me, my books are all very different. They've all presented a different challenge in the writing and the structure or the research, but I think as a reader, you'll find a lot of things recurring. There's, always, there's almost always somebody growing vegetables. And that's because I grow up with sort of eating the old tomato and I think I'm an expert. There's always food and family. There's always a romance. And I think, I'm not really sure, and obviously it was Italy. I'm not sure really why those elements keep recurring in the books. The food thing I blame my father for because he is a passionate cook. He met my mother in Rome in the 1950s, which is when When in Rome is set. And um, after several false starts and arguments and storming back to England, she married him. Got pregnant with me incredibly quickly. They moved back to the UK. And my father, who had never probably touched a kitchen utensil in his life, because southern Italian men, they don't do anything around the house, mm -hmm. they're little princes. Um, after about a year of my mother's cooking, her specialities included boiled fish, <laughs> and the, the Liverpool dish, the, the sort of regional dish of the is called Scouts. Is anyone from Merseyside? Mm -hmm. She had Scouts. Yes. Well, I don't know if it's like this all the time, but my mother's version involved buying some grisly meat. She must have gone into the butchers and said, can I have your most grisly cut, please? <laughs> Boiling it for hours with potatoes and carrots, and then serving up this kind of grey mush. I think she did it on purpose because the result was, to this day, she never cooks. My father is the cook in the house. He, he wrote to his sisters and said, please will you send me recipes. He haunted the local supermarket where capsicum was wildly exotic. And they never <laughs> sold because no one knew what to do with them. So at the end of the day, they marked them down. So he waited till they marked them down and he snapped them up. And he made these tremendous meals that, um, you know, we still, as a family, love his food. And he comes to see me, and there's a terrible battle over the kitchen because he still thinks nobody but, but him can cook. And it's impossible to get him to show you a dish because he waits to get back to tell and he starts shoving things in quietly. You say, what was that? Dad? Nothing. <laughs> He's really sneaky about it. I guess for me, food is more, it's a, it's a necessary everyday pleasure. But it's also about more than just eating. It's a way we show people we love them, we bring comfort to people, we apologise to people. It's a celebration, it's a commiseration. It's quite a sort of sensuous thing, really, in lots of ways. You know, if I cook you something, you put it inside your body. That's pretty intimate, really. Mm -hmm. So food in my books ca carries with it all sorts of things. That said, I did not mean to put any book in When in Rome. It was meant to be quite a different sort of a novel. I first had the idea for this book when I was doing the thing I most criticised my husband, the one I met in the Wairapa. I most criticised him for wasting time on the internet. So it's ironic that that's exactly what I was doing. I wasn't on trade meet looking at boats. I can't afford that. I just want to be <laughs> <laughs> And cars. Look at this, Nikki. It's an Aston Martin DB5. This is what you're going to buy me when Men in Rome's made into a movie. <laughs> There'll be out of production a lot by then. <laughs> So I was supposed to be writing my last book, The Villa Girls, and one of the things that authors do when they're a bit stuck is they start thinking about what they might quite like to write instead of the book they're meant to be writing. And I just read two really interesting books that fictionalised real people. One was a book called The Paris Wife by an author called Paula McLean, and that's about Ernest Hemingway and a period in his life when he was with his first wife living in Paris. Have you read it? It's very good, isn't it? And there was another one called The Great Lover by a writer called Jill Dawson, which is about Rupert Brooke. And I was quite intrigued by this idea of taking a real person and turning them into a fiction. And so I started to think, if I was going to do that, you know, instead of writing The Villa Girls, which I was due to deliver to my editor in seconds, but if I was going to fictionalise a real person, who would I fictionalise? And I thought first about Enrico Caruso, who was a great Neapolitan opera singer. So I googled him. And up came a picture of a rather plain looking chap. And I remembered Enrico Caruso as young and vibrant and handsome and sparkly eyed. And that's when I realised I was actually thinking of Mario Lanza, the Hollywood star, who played him in a biopic called The Great Caruso, 
which as a, as a sort of young woman and child, I love 1950s movies. I still kind of love a Cary Grant movie or Jimmy Stewart, all those old films. Um, the Great Caruso, I have to say, is not a standout movie, but I'd obviously been quite impressed by Mario Lanza. So I Googled him. I wasted an entire day watching YouTube clips of him. His voice was just so amazing, even on my cruddy old laptop, you know, it sent shivers down my spine. And then I read a little bit about his story and realized that he'd spent several years in Rome. Now, he was American, he grew up in Philadelphia. I couldn't have written a book about him set in Philadelphia. I don't know the city, I don't have a huge desire to go there. But I have spent time in Rome on and off over the years. I've never lived there. And as I said, my parents met there in the 50s, and I grew up looking at all these incredibly glamorous pictures of them wearing their cool 1950s clothes, like the dress. And um, by the Trevi Fountain, you know, my mother had those glasses like cat's eyes and a sort of white trouser suit with a charm bracelet and her hair was like this. So I've always really loved that era. I've always thought it was glamorous and I love the idea of setting the book there. The more I read about Mary Lanza, the more I could see that there was a fantastic story to grab. The thing about him is, in his day, in the 50s, he was a bigger star than Frank Sinatra. But he hasn't really had the enduring popularity. So if you ask anyone under 40 if they've heard of him, unless they're fans of the movie Heavenly Creatures, they just look blankly at you. A lady today came along to an event I did in Wanaka with all her Mario Lanza biographies in her bag. She was substantially older than 40. <laughs> and I kind of felt like it was almost like this, his story might disappear and that there was this opportunity to kind of remind people of him. But he's not the main character in the story. The main character in Wedding Rome is a naive young woman called Serafina. And when the book opens, she is living in Trastevere, which was at the time quite a working class at Wedding <coughs> Rome. And that's very glamorous and full of restaurants and bars. And um, she and her sisters love musicals, love Mario Lanza, and they go off around the city busking to earn change to sort of spend on gelato and Coca Cola. They find out that Mario Lanza is coming to Rome to make a movie called Arriva Deci Roma. And so they decide that one of the sisters has got an amazing voice and they decide to try and get Mario to listen to her sing in the hope that he will discover her and help make her famous. What ends up happening is that Serafina gets a job in his household. And so the, the stories dovetail. Although it's Serafina's story, there's lots of Mario in there too. Um, it was really difficult to write this book. Had I understood how difficult it was to fictionalise a real person, I would have done something else entirely. But of course, by the time I realised that, I was well into it. One of the big problems for me was there's been lots written by him, but my character lived in his house. And so I needed to know what he was like as a husband and a father and a private individual. And sure, I could make stuff up, but you, you sort of want as much as possible to be authentic. So I was really, really lucky, and I managed, um, there's a British Mario Lanza Society, they're very active and they hold Mario Lanza, they do have a gala dinner every year, and at the gala dinner every year is Mario's surviving child, who's a woman called Elisa Lanza Bregman, and she lives in Los Angeles now, she's probably in her 60s, I think. And so I got in touch with them, and they put me in touch with one of the biographers who put me in touch with Elisa, who was very generous and very gracious, and even though I was a stranger to her and she didn't really know what I was going to write, she told me all sorts of stuff. Like, stuff that to most people wouldn't be all that interesting, like where was the kitchen in the house that you lived in in Rome? You know, just kind of crazy little details that I just wanted to have right. And that really helped me, but it also was, made it more difficult because I wasn't just writing about a famous person anymore. I was writing about the father of this woman who'd been really kind to me and I liked. So I had a real struggle with that, and then I did an event with um, Joanne Trollope, do you know her, the writer? I was sort of chairing an event with her, and I was talking to her about it, and she said, when you write, you have to not think about anybody, just think about the story. So it's really interesting how, how you progress with a book, often you get these little nuggets of advice, because I was a bit stuck, I was sort of thinking, he did some, he was a troubled man, you know, he had some big ups and downs in his life, Mario Lanza, and I wanted to be able to write about those, but I didn't want to upset Elisa. So, she was a great help. I guess when I write a book, my big aim, so I'm just going to have a bit of water, I've got a cold, I'm quite sick actually. I'm being very brave. <laughs> my big aim is to, um, what I want is for the readers to almost forget that they're reading. 
I don't want you to sit there thinking, I'll just finish this chapter and then I can go to sleep. I want you to feel as if you're in Italy. You know, for some of my books, I want you to feel like you're in the piazza and you're, you're watching the life go on around you. With this one, I want you to feel like you're in Mario Lanza's household and you're watching the terrible effect fame has on him and you're wondering what's going to happen to Serafina. Sometimes when I do that thing that you should never do and read my reviews on Amazon, the reviews are generally pretty funny, you shouldn't do it because you're never going to please everyone. So there's, you know, one person will say five stars and I loved it and one will go, I fell asleep, preferred the latest Nora Roberts and it touches you quick. And sometimes I'll say things, I love this book but it was an easy read and it's almost like it's a bad thing for a book to be an easy read. But for me, good writing doesn't have to be difficult to read. And for a book to be worthwhile, it doesn't have to be hard work. And all the writers I love most, like um, this UK writer called Rose Tremaine, I adore, and Audrey Niffenegg, you know, the time traveller's mm -hmm. wife, I find I get lost in their books. Their writing is brilliant. And I keep those books by writers I think are brilliant. And when I get completely stuck and think I'm rubbish at this, I just read a few paragraphs and I go, that's right, that's what good writing is. But it's not difficult, it's elegant and simple, and that's what I, I really strive for. Whether I succeed or not, I guess that's up to the readers to decide. I love it when I get emails from readers, though, who say things like, I was having a rubbish time, or I was convalescing from an illness, or my boss was being really stink, and I went home and I read your book, and it took me away, and I felt like I was in Italy. When I finished the book, I gained 10 kilos, and I felt like I'd been on holiday. <laughs> be my big aim really to, to take readers away, to deliver them to Italy. Because Italy's a long way away, you know, so most of us don't get to go there all that often. And people think I go, you know, people say to me, oh, you spend six months in Italy? <laughs> no, I don't. I have been for four years and I just went back there um, in June and had three weeks there during which I frantically researched. Now people roll their eyes when I say this. But I actually did work this time. I didn't just drift around and eat gelato and look at the view and go, pretty, pretty, now I'll write a book set here. So now I'm busy with the next book. And um, this one's set in Sicily. I am not a great planner when it comes to books. I've interviewed authors who plan the whole book out from start to finish. And I think it's probably less stressful doing it that way. But I like to give my characters a chance to surprise me. And I think if I planned the whole book out, I'd be so bored I wouldn't be able to write it anymore because I'd know what, exactly what happened. So I was saying, as I was saying earlier today, I decided with the new book that I was going to write a complete... All my male characters are complicated and difficult. And I thought, I'm just going to write a really hot, uncomplicated guy. He's just going to look sexy in a tall belt and all the readers <laughs> are going to fall in love with him. So I started writing this guy that was going quite well until about 15,000 words in when it became horribly apparent to me that he was running from his difficult past. <laughs> I was like, not only is this not what I wanted to happen, but I don't know what his difficult past was. <laughs> and then, the other day, I was driving somewhere, and I suddenly realised, and I was so shocked I almost crashed the car, I can't tell you, you'll be too shocked to. <laughs> but it is, it is very, it's a very sort of organic process. It's not an organ... I think it's probably because I'm quite a chaotic person. I'm not super planning and organised about my life, and that's reflected in my books. So if you're a planner, then you need to plan your books. If you're someone like me that's not entirely sure what they're doing tomorrow morning, <laughs> you cannot plan them. But at the end of the day, I think, it's just about... If, you're gonna, if anyone here wants to write, people say, write what you know. I don't think that's true. I think write what you love. If you love chiclet, write chiclet. If you love crime, write crime. But don't attempt to do it just because... Don't go and study law just because you think you're going to get a job <laughs> and you don't love it. That would be it. Now, I feel like I've whiffled on for my entire life. I just wanted... Has anybody got any questions? Anybody in the audience? Yeah, um, you mentioned when um, you were going to write your first book that you were going to have to do it without the trip to Italy. Yeah. And I just wondered when you actually did have your first trip to Italy. Well, that first book, I had obviously spent childhood um, holidays in Italy because my father being from Italy and growing up in England, in the summers we used to all pile into his Morris 1100 and we'd drive to Italy <laughs> with us kids in the back seat. And my mum and dad doing that thing parents do. Shut up, you two! You know, with the slappy hand in the back seat. And my dad would often crash into things along the way because he's not a very good driver. 
And we finally get there, and um, my father's family are they essentially, essentially peasant stock, and most of them haven't ever left Italy. And they would, they, so they would, they think we're, they've never even been to visit in England. You know, they're very, very about being at home. And they live in um, this hideous town. And it was hideous then, it's about 100 times more hideous now. People always think I went to this gorgeous, glamorous place. But actually, it's on the outskirts of Naples, and it's really poor, and it's all those big high-rise buildings. And then one of my aunties, the one that doesn't live in a high-rise building, she lives in a sort of house that was built with the earthquake fund money. Only they weren't affected by the earthquake. My uncle's connected. <laughs> right. And it's surrounded by, because they're in the um, car wreck business, and they store the car wrecks in what used to be the big <laughs> churches. So they live in this house, just completely surrounded by wrecked cars, and with pictures dropping on them, because they never cut the trees down. <coughs> and um, so I, I had been there, and all that stuff was in my memory. And Delicious is really based around the, the new house, the orange illegal house, where they now live. They have only been there probably for about 15 years, and prior to that, they lived in this little sh sort of shack. So Delicious was based around the little shack that they lived in, and my memories of that, my memories of my auntie. And so when I finally went back there, the book was already published, and I hadn't been probably for about 10 years, and it was amazing to see. It was all sort of exactly as I described it. That often makes me laugh when people say, oh, it really made me want to visit Italy, and I'm like, not that part. <laughs> <laughs> Don't go there. Like every other country, it's got its really scrunchy bits. Mm. <laughs> but yeah, I, and I'd love to go back more often, but like everybody, I have to save up and um, get permission from my husband. <laughs> I've got a question. Yeah. You juggle your writing with your journalism, and yeah. how do you, do you, how do you find jumping between the two? Is that... <coughs> it, no, it can be a bit of a nightmare because the journalism deadlines are always the most pressing. Mm. But um, I've written a book a year for four years and that also requires... It's a lot of time just mm. you know, to write. I'm not a fast writer particularly. So I bleat and moan about it a lot and I often, it can be really frustrating if you've had a fantastic day working on the book but the next day you've got to jump over and do some journalism. Probably the healthy thing about it is that writing a book is very, very solitary and you're in your own head telling your own stories. And journalism is much more about going out into the world and telling other people's stories. I think it's healthy to have that balance. I think I might get quite neurotic. And also, it's really good for me to go, oh, look, here's my column in the Women's Weekly or here's my column in the Herald Sunday. I achieved something last week. Mm -hmm. If the book's not going quite well, it's good to see that you actually have managed to do something. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's like anything, it's got pros and cons, and I think if I was to just write, it would be easier in some ways, but I might be, become more annoying to live with, and apparently I'm already quite annoying to live with. <laughs> Anyone else? Any questions? More questions? No? I've got some real trivia -y ones, if that's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I was going to ask, I mean, if you, as and when the time comes for you to retire, do you think you would go to Italy? Um, I don't think I'll ever be able to afford to retire. <laughs> and I actually don't think I'll ever retire, to be honest. I think that um, all the people I know who are older than I must admire still do something. It might not be the actual job that they did, yeah. but they still do something. I think yeah. that's quite a good thing. Yeah. I don't know. I, I was... Um, because I've got dogs, and my old dog died last year, and I had a younger one, and I said to my husband, we are not getting another dog, and when this one goes, we're going to go and spend some time in Italy. And of course, got a <laughs> So, he's like, what's happened to Italy? And I said, well, instead of going in our 50s, we'll be going in our 60s. But we'll get there. I don't know. And I love going there, I'd like to spend more time there, but it is quite a chaotic country. People are, they're a very passionate race, and they're very warm and generous, but they're also really disorganised. I think that would annoy you if you lived there. Yeah. And is your father still in the UK? Yeah, he wow. is. And um, he loves to come here because he loves it. he loves the produce and the fish and the vegetables and things. That's really cool. And my mother wanders into the kitchen at six o'clock and goes, "What's for dinner?" <laughs> <laughs> and he, he comes over. I, and last time he was here, I said, "Look, we're getting a bit fat." Can we just have one course? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't 
done the pasta for a starter, and then the meat and the vegetables, and then often there'll be some cheese. And he, um, if you try to say, look, no, I've had enough. He piles it onto your plate and goes, shut up, I need it. <laughs> really no arguing with that. He actually is the basis for one of the characters in um, the Italian Wedding and the Villa Girls, Beppe, uh, who is a very, he's very like that, very warm, passionate, loving, annoying Italian man. And I said to my mother, um, what does Dad think about me using him for Beppe? And she went, he hasn't noticed. <laughs> What, what are the titles of your books in order? Uh, the first one was Delicious. Yeah. The second one went through a brief period of being called The Gypsy Tea Room, but my publishers decided they didn't like that, so now it's called Summer at the Villa Rosa. And then The Italian Wedding, Recipe for Life, When in Rome. Is that all of them? Yes. Oh, yeah. there yeah. yeah. <laughs> And um, quite, they're sort of interlinked. Um, Quite often characters crop in and out, not this one, because obviously it's set in a different era, right. and places crop, crop in and out, but it doesn't really matter what order you read them in. It doesn't matter if you recognise the characters from previous books, because I always find that ir irritating when you pick up and it turns out to be a sequel and you haven't read the first mm. one, you don't know what's going on. Mm. So Are they the same age or different ages or what? Different ages, yeah. Right. Yeah. Like you can kind of read them as sequels or yeah. prequels or standalone. Do you, do you set your own deadline of a, a novel a year? Or, yeah. I wouldn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> no, the publishers really like it, and that's because, I guess, it, it builds momentum and you develop a readership and people look out for your next book. I mean, I know I read a Marion Keyes' books, mm -hmm. and so when a new Marion Keyes comes out, I always grab it. And um, she hasn't had a book out for a while because she's too, too, too depressed to write. Mm -hmm. And you sort of, yeah, you miss them. So they, they like that idea. It is quite hard though. Yeah, it's quite don't, don't get sort of it's, it, it just not inspired or not. You know, it's difficult to get going on something more original. Or I mean, or can you just come up with it's, something each year? It is difficult, but when I was working full time, I was editing, editing the New Zealand Women's Weekly. That was the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Mm. And so I always think, when I'm, I bleed and moan, it's too hard and I can't do it, and then I think, well, I could go back and edit the world this week, and that would be much worse. <laughs> so I guess, yeah, it's, it's not as difficult as trying to manage 18 people and bring a magazine out every week and be nice to the advertisers and all the other things that magazine editors have got to do. And I guess also, if I didn't have a deadline, it's not like the first book where I was just writing away you know, kind of happily. It's different now. It's become my job. Um, if I didn't have a deadline, I'd probably never do it. I'd always find there's always something better to do, isn't it? You know, there's mould that needs sponging from the ceiling. You know. <laughs> Gosh, I'll just do that. So, <laughs> deadlines are quite important. And, yeah. and are you still with the same publisher and the same agent? Um, my first agent really sadly died. So I've got a different agent, but I'm still with the same publisher, yeah. And they've been great. They're based in the UK, so it's a bit tricky because you have to do everything by email and you don't have a very close relationship to them. But when I do go to London, they're really nice. They take me for lunch at posh restaurants and buy me wine, so it's <laughs> And I've, I've um, got a new editor now, but she's really, really good too. And I think that um, quite often I read New Zealand novels and I think, this is a great book, but it just hasn't been edited right. Mm -hmm. So I feel kind of really, really fortunate to have been published by Orion and have had this fantastic expert help. Even though when I get the 26 pages of helpful suggestions, I run around the house to cry and scream and stamp my feet and drink gin. It is, <laughs> in the long run, it's a positive thing. So do you have a, a word limit on the minimum of words that they want for a novel or not? Not really. I think... Um, it's right as much as that. Well, I think a kind of 80 to 100,000 words is probably the ideal. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could write anything longer than 100,000. I think I'd just write the end. But, you know, who knows? Mm -hmm. I never really know when I start out how long it's going to be or how long it's going to take to tell the story. Mm -hmm. um, and some writers obviously write those huge bricks. I don't know how they do that, though. I don't know how they keep the story in their head. And I do a lot of rereading and changing and twiddling, and it would just take me years. So is the focus always Italy? 
It has been so far, and someone asked me the other day, would you write a book set in New Zealand? But I almost feel like I need to not live in a place to distill what it is about it that makes it special and different. Mm -hmm. And I just think I could write a book in New Zealand, maybe set in New Zealand, but not while I live here full time. Because you're so, life's so cluttered, isn't it? You know, there's so much kind of going on in life. And it's hard to sort of just totally distill the important things. But who knows? I'd really like, I ride horses, I'd really like to write a horse novel. And not just so as I can tax deduct my pony. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I don't know if I ever will. Yeah? Have you ever thought of writing any more poetry? If that's what got you started in the first place. Well, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> I've written a couple of short stories, um, but I don't think. Poetry is terrifically difficult because it's so mm. pared down. Every word counts. Mm. And it's really different. I mean, I think I'm more of a storyteller than, you know, a, a poetic writer, so I think it would be rubbish. <laughs> Although they are short, you can finish one. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> one in the dark. <laughs> I've got one more question. Yeah. Like, the first time you went on a tour like this, I mean, how did you find that? Because often you speak to authors and they, they find it quite hard because obviously the solitary yeah. experience of writing a book and then suddenly being out kind of in the public and presenting. How did you find that first tour? Well, because I'd had the, the Angela Dorney experience, that, that helped me a little bit because I had to do radio and TV and um, talk at the launch of the book. And, and I really felt I had to do that because she couldn't. You know, mm. I was absolutely forced into it, otherwise I wouldn't have. And it sort of wasn't as bad as I thought it would be because mm. people are generally there because they want to hear you, not because they hate you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so they're friendly and, um, yeah, so when I went on tour, although my first tour they did send two publicists with me, so I'm not sure what they thought I was going to do. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, yeah, it was, it was fun actually. And, and now going on tour is really nice because, like, earlier today in Monaco, a couple of people said to me, I've read all your books and it's kind of a real thrill to meet people because you are just sitting on your own writing and you've no idea whether people are reading the books and liking the books. And I have got a website now and people can email me through that, so that's really great. Mm -hmm. I get emails from all sorts of weird places, like where the book's not even on sale, I don't know how they've got hold of it. Wow. But yeah, so that's great too. So it's good to get that feedback, definitely. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We've got time for a couple more questions if anyone has any, otherwise... I could say. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> Do you all know who he is? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, yeah, you're all kind of the same age group as me, so you know. No. <laughs> you don't know, you're much too young. Not me. Well, I, can, I do hope that people listen to him again because he's just got such a great voice. Mm. And um, yeah, obviously he was quite a contentious, controversial character during the course of his life. I should find out if you read Wedding in Rome. But whatever he was like personally, man, he could sing. Wow. Cool. We'll have to look to see if there's any in the library, actually. Mm. So have uh, we got any in the collection? You have to just get by some for the library. Lots. Yeah. I'll just, just, I'll just send an email to the collection development team. Yes. <laughs> Do you bring into it how he humiliated himself to be? Yeah. yeah. That's quite sad. And I've read, you know, stories about him. Oh. He was my era, <laughs> my teenage. Well, because I, I, I think it's the same for stars today. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they've always got this pressure on them to be thin, thin, thin. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that it was the same in the 50s. He was constantly being told he had to lose weight to be in the movies. And his natural inclination was probably to be a bit on the heavier side. And he felt that he sang better when he was heavier. Opera stars are often a little mm -hmm. bit bigger. Mm -hmm. But they wanted him thin. And if you watch some of the films, because they're shot out of sequence, and he was on these starvation diets. He goes up and down in size, alarmingly mm. between the scenes. You know, he'd be like this in one, like this in the next one. So it, it obviously really destroyed his health. But that really interested me that fame hasn't changed that much, really. It's, you know, if you're not a strong personality, it's destructive now, and it was in the 1950s, even though there wasn't the same, there wasn't the internet or all the magazines that there are today. It was the same. Mm. What's his best movie? I don't think any of them were that good. People say The Great Caruso. And I like the one, it's called Seven Hills of Rome, the movie he makes during the course of the book. 
I like it because it's fun and there's lots of kind of party scenes and things, but it's not going to be much of a plot. <laughs> <laughs> and he's handsome in it. Um, and Rome looks fantastic, so yeah. What was it called again? It's called The Seven Hills of Rome. In the book it's called A Rivederci Roma because that's what it's called in Italy. But, um, and I think they're about to re-release it on DVD actually. So, because lots, lots of them, I had to go to this shop in Brooklyn called Videon where they're all painfully trendy and young and they wear beanies. And were, I went in and said, have you got any Marion Lanz movies? And they just looked at me. And then they said, we might have in our video section, but it's uncatalogued. And I said, can you find them for me? And they were, <laughs> and then they eat them out one a week. And they were such bad quality. You know, video anyway, when you, mm. when you watch things on DVD now, video was terrible. But these have just been just chucked in a pile and damaged. And, so I didn't manage to watch them all. I probably watched about four or five of them. That was enough fun to get the flavour, I think. Did you watch them? Well, I saw them as a teenager, the but we didn't mm -hmm. care what the, the, the rubbish, as long as you feel them safe. Same. That's yeah. what we went for, you know, you just went there and sing. I don't even remember the stories. No, well, no. no. Usually he was an opera singer. Yeah. And um, I think they were the best one's Serenade. That's the one I like the most. Yeah. <coughs> So have your books been translated into Italian? No. Would you be nervous if they were? At all? Um, I used to think so, but quite a few Italian English speaking English speaking Italians have read them and emailed me and said they like them. So because obviously I'm half Italian, but I didn't grow up there, so I'm an outsider. Mm. But um, yeah, that none of them have said this is complete rubbish. <laughs> and it is really scary. Like the Villa Girls is set on an olive estate in mm. Italy. I actually did the research in Waikiki. <laughs> Interviewed this fantastic woman who has spent a lot of time in Italy and is a very sort of mover and shaker in the olive oil industry. Uh, but when I was in Sicily in June, I went to an olive estate and I was really scared that I was going to discover that I had made some horrible <laughs> error. And I kept asking the man all these questions and do you do this and do you do that and do you do the other thing? He was all like, yes, yes, yes. Thank you. <laughs> probably thought you were incredibly knowledgeable. Yeah, you probably thought I was a rival olive oil maker because it's a deal with Not a neurotic author convinced she made a terrible error somewhere in the world. Do you speak Italian yourself and was Italian spoken in your childhood? No, because when my father moved to England, my mum was pregnant with me and he um, didn't speak brilliant English so he was really busy learning it. And I distinctly remember the first time he tried to speak to me in Italian. I was so upset by this weird noise coming out of my father's mouth, stuck my fingers in my ears and screamed. <laughs> so we didn't learn it as kids. I learned it at university a bit, and mm. I sort of do that listening to CDs in my car thing, and I keep meaning to go to classes. I speak it a bit, well enough to have a really sort of, you know, simple conversation. But last time I was there, someone said to me, tell me. What is the economic and political situation in New Zealand? And I was like, oh, you're kidding me. <laughs> I think I said, similar to here. <laughs> there was just no way I could go into it. <laughs> yeah. Is your book available as an e-book? Um, I think so, yeah, I think it is on Amazon. I know that there are issues with downloading in different territories, and I'm not sure, I'm pretty sure you can. It should be. It should be yeah, able to. I've almost finished it on my Oh, have you? Did you get it on Amazon? Yeah. yeah. So, yes. I haven't quite done the e-book thing myself yet. I can't oh, quite I bring myself. Oh, you need to share. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I can't quite bring myself to read on, on the Kindle yet. It's, I'm still fond of, and you see, I, I write in them. You can't write on your Kindle, can you? It's no. <laughs> Apparently they're very popular with men because you have a beautiful cover and it's got a pink dress. So they might not want to be seen in public reading something they want to read if they've got a pink dress on the front, but they can download it on a Kindle yeah. and no one knows what it is that they're reading or who it's Apparently that's one of the reasons Fifty Shades of Grey is so <laughs> Quietly, discreetly on the pillows. <laughs>